Uh, well, I've been photographing for 56 years and I've um, sustained myself and lived off it for 42. Without wanting to be a show-off, I've, I've grossed over $600 million, employed 125 people and became a major publisher. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, we were closed down by COVID two years ago. <laughs> So uh, I'm now doing, principally doing public speaking, uh, online talks, online marketing and promotions, but really specialising in helping people find purpose and direction uh, in their lives. Yeah. Over overcoming uh, stress, anxiety, worrying about stuff, getting out of their heads and bringing joy into their lives. And we can all do that, it, regardless of whether they're seems to be impenetrable life challenges. I guess now, in my later years, I'm more interested in humans, human behaviour, and uh, focusing on bring, bring people bringing joy into their lives and, and, and also into digital art, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in life, things change. I mean, the world of publishing, the window to the world of publishing sort of really opened in the mid-70s uh, and then it's sort of starting to close now because people have got the internet, they've got their mobile phones um, and uh, <laughs> in many ways that's a, that's a massive challenge, trying to get people out of their, out of the phone environment uh, in, in, into, into the natural world and, and uh, uh, doing the connection with it. So no, none of this is based on a specific religion or, 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 or a, or a uh, political movement. It's just basically individual pride and joy in, in uh, bringing fun and happiness into your life. Pretty, pretty basic stuff, really. Well, my belief is you follow your heart. You know, if you have a passion for something, whatever that passion is, you lock onto it and you, you keep going. We, and, and that, I mean, I'm interested in music, I'm interested in gardening, I'm interested in what people have do, are doing with their lives that brings them joy and purpose and direction. And uh, spending as little time as possible uh, in the, the echo chamber of negativity. And I think, I think one, of the, one of the wonderful keys, there's two, there's two words, open-mindedness is one, having an open mind to absolutely everything reflect, consider, uh, and the other one is naivety. Naivety can be a blessing. And what I mean by naivety isn't being stupid. It's, a, it's got to do with, if you're an artist and you create artwork and you enjoy that artwork and you celebrate that artwork, the opinion, her opinion of your artwork is not really relevant. It's your opinion of your own artwork that is relevant. I do a lot of art teaching too, but with cameras and you know di digital software, do a lot of abstracts and that sort of thing. Trying to encourage people to become their own art director, uh, consider themselves as being unique. There, there, are, there are a series of roadblocks that we run into. No time, no money, too many others doing whatever it is that you want to pursue. And I guess when I grew up, we didn't have that influence. So in many ways, my mother did me, did me a favour by not letting all that stuff into my life, and I really just focused on, on nature. And I started to learn to have a great deal of fun and joy on my own, or with people that were of like mind. Um, and now in my life, I just don't associate with people that, that don't have a positive attitude. I don't care whether, what colour they are, or what religion they are, or what their political views are. But I look for positive attitudes, and I surround myself with people that speak Speak to their own truth. Through the new, I go through the Facebook feed. I'm on Facebook every day. I, got, I had a post the other day that went up to 5,500 likes. <laughs> I'm 77. I'm an old guy. I got really excited. And you read the comments underneath. Uh, but it's so easy to go through that news feed and see people that are doing really much more exciting things than you perceive and to start to feel a little envy, a little bit of the mind story goes on about... Uh, What's, what's the point of my doing it when there's so many other people doing it and doing it better or you consider to be better? So you've just got to keep coming back to the fact and what you need is a great big photograph of yourself underneath that you put 
I am unique. <laughs> There's only one of you. And uh, I stress that in, 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 in I've got an online, online masterclass where we actually start with I am unique. And I talk about growing up with my two sisters and we came from the same mother and we were raised, we ate the same food, we sat at the same dining table, we went to the same church on Sundays, yet we grew up to become three completely different people. So uh, there's just a few simple rules in my opinion. Fishing one day, I had a very large creature swim up. This is Adelaide, by the way, and there's a lot of sharks, particularly white pointer sharks, on the South Australian coast. You get them down here as well. But one of these swam into my world and ate all the fish on my float, which when you're 16 years old and you're alone in the ocean with a tiny little spear gun is pretty, pretty heart-stopping. But sometime later, I... Uh, visited the South Australian Museum and met a scientist and I asked him what that huge fish could possibly be and he started telling me stories about sharks and he introduced me to my first childhood hero. Now this is a time there was no internet, there was no television and it, my, my parents were very, very strict. We weren't even allowed a radio, would you believe? My mother was a preacher and she was scared that the devil might come into our lives via these mediums. And uh, so I had, um, I only had a couple of books. I had National Geographic, which really excited me. So that introduced me to the science, the behaviour, if you like, of sharks. And I was invited by the people at the museum to go on a fish collecting expedition. And that's me at exactly your age, on the right hand side, obviously. That's me at the age of 16 with my little fish net. And the gentleman on the left was a pioneer underwater photographer. He was the first underwater photographer in Australia. And while we were underwater, he handed me his camera and I took that very photograph. So it was my first photograph of a wild animal. Two weeks later, we had a reunion similar to this. He flashed it on the screen and the audience applauded. Now, that was pretty exciting for me because I didn't have much of a self-esteem. I didn't have a lot of self-belief. And so that gave me a bit of a prompt to become very interested. About a year later, uh, at the age of late 17, uh, I joined the Royal Australian Navy and trained as a diver and finished up doing search and rescue work. That's me on the left, winching the Admiral in the South China Sea off the back of a warship. So it was a pretty exciting uh, opportunity. I served on two ships, HMAS Melbourne and also Vendetta, and toured the world and bought my first camera while I was in Hong Kong. So it was a journey. You can see the progression of the journey. When I got back to Sydney, I met the director of the uh, Australian Museum, the, who was an expert on fish. I, I became very, very interested in marine fish. No formal qualifications, just a really deep interest. And he encouraged me because in those days, uh, scientists didn't dive. So the idea of getting nice, colourful, bright uh, images of the fish uh, was pretty exciting to the museum. Now, when you're working with a scientist, if you wanted to get involved in science, you always ask them questions about what it is that interests them the most. Now, Dr John Paxton had done his PhD on the luminescent bacteria on the lower lip of a fish called Clydopus gloria maris. Isn't that exciting? A night fish. Now that bacteria, they, they lift the, the, a little membrane and it becomes a head, like a little headlight, one on either side of the jaw, and they swim around near the bottom and they shine those lights and look for little shrimps and then eat the little shrimps. That's pretty exciting stuff. So I collected a couple of those and I brought them into the museum, which really excited him. Now, about a year and a half, two years later, I was drafted to Albatross, the air base down in southern New South Wales, and I started photographing the fish in Jervis Bay. So I set myself a project. And what I found throughout my entire life is the idea of having a passion, then setting a project, and then pursuing that project, if you like a dream, the thing that you want to do with your life. And I didn't know at the time that that would actually go on to become my lifelong career. 
So for 40 years I've run a publishing company and I'm going to introduce you to that, that all grew out of a childhood experience. All the way. And of course at the time I was pretty naive about where that direction would take me. So I started photographing all the fish. So those photographs are about 50, 60 years old. That's how long ago I took them. And you can see the invertebrates, beautifully coloured, brightly coloured, and I started to learn to write because I'd never learnt at school to write. And it's very easy for me to say, <laughs> I probably sound like your mother and father here, but every opportunity you have in life, seize it. Every skill, every opportunity to grow your skill base, you accept it. And so I fell in love with words, of all things, because I'd never formally been taught to express myself either orally or with writing. And that's done me very well. I've actually written over 30 books and published over 2,000 in my career. Uh, these are some of the books that are in the market, and they're in the market now. And they are all, the theme of these books is marine life. So it's the theme that I first started with. When I left the Park Service, sorry, when I left the Royal Australian Navy, I joined the National Park Service as a photographer where I worked for seven years. And my first assignment, that's me on my first assignment, was to photograph the Herbert River ringtail possum, which was the logo. You saw that on the first slide, there it is there. They had the logo, but they didn't have a photograph of the possum. So my first charter was to go into the forest with the scientists and photograph a possum. Now, you can imagine someone that was familiar with photographing fish underwater. That was quite a challenge to go into the rainforest because possums live up about as high as that ceiling and you're out in the forest and it's night time and you've got a telephoto lens and a flashlight. And, of course, in those days, this sort of thing just didn't happen. I'm talking... I'm talking way back in the 70s. And uh, I fell in love with the possums of Australia. There's 19 different species of possum in Australia. And I fell in love with their behaviour and their natural history. And I've been, I've been a passionate advocate for possums ever since. One particular group of animals. Uh, while with the Park Service, we also work with the ABC doing natural history books and natural history films. And one of the trips that I did, a very exciting trip to the Great Barrier Reef, was to do the underwater cine, photographer, cine photography on a series about the turtles of the Great Barrier Reef. You can see here, this is the scientist working on the turtles. And of course, a lot of those photographs now come back and finish up in books for kids of all ages. This is, a, this is from a spread in a range of books called Nature Watch for six, seven, eight-year-olds. It's a little bit lower than your age group. Uh, also birds, Dr Gavin Blackman introduced me to birds and I started working with scientists. And I, I evolved to see a great opportunity for me as a photographer to work with scientists and help them tell their stories about the natural history of the animals and plants they were working on. And I finally left them and I went out on my own and, and I started touring Australia and collecting in all the states a huge collection of different animals telling the natural history, the social history, right across Australia. And I developed in writing, and this is, some, this is a, an exercise maybe your teachers can encourage you to do, I actually penned what I call a creative life purpose. I documented what it was I wanted to do with my life. And the one on the right, I want to inspire others to regard the natural world as essential for their spiritual, physical and mental well-being. On the left, I want to inspire children and provide every opportunity for them to connect to nature. So children's publishing I started working on in mid-1995. So having, documenting those purposes, writing it into your phone, uh, is, has been for me a real guiding light throughout my whole career. That's the range of books, the Nature Watch range. And you can see here a lovely spread on the mammals of Australia. Also introducing 
kids to the natural habitats where animals live, how they live, how they survive in those natural habitats. So wildlife project themes. Uh, right across Australia, looking at all the different habitats. You can see here, this is just one micro habitat. These are the Pandanus woodlands of the tropical north of Australia. So each habitat, each micro habitat, each element within that uh, ecosystem has its own wildlife. You can see here frogs, birds, bats, all sorts of things that are endemic and live only in these Pandani forests. So storytelling, you can see here the, the mammals. And we're going to look, just look at a couple of them. Mammals like kangaroos and wombats and koalas and possums and bandicoots and echidnas, all these different kinds of animals. Each of them have stories uh, that can be interwoven into wonderful stories to share. Particularly interested in kangaroos, the different species of kangaroos. There are 55 different kinds of kangaroos. Each of them uh, is a different species altogether. They live in different habitats, they're different sizes. Some kangaroos live underground, some of them live up trees. Uh, all sorts of different places. So while I was, in the, while I was uh, doing a book on the Great Dividing Range, I became very excited with the, the wallabies that live amongst the rocks on the Great Dividing Range. You can see here, this is a female doughy-eyed wallaroo. And I started to become then very interested in uh, photographing all the different kinds of kangaroos. This is the bridal nail tail kangaroo. Many of them are in fact endangered. A lot of their habitats have been uh, endangered. So their behaviour, you can see here, yawning, scratching. Uh, the bats spent a lot of time, spent nearly two years photographing bats in caves all over Australia and learning to tell their stories. The frogs, all the different kinds of frogs, uh, right through the lizards, the snakes, the turtles, the crocodiles, and you can see here, uh, wonderful storytelling. Going out at night with a headlight, put the headlight on your head and you pick up the eye shine of the, of the different animals. Reptiles actually reflect back to you, uh, particularly the geckos. Uh, and that's how we find them in the dark. And most of these animals, of course, are nocturnal. They only come out at night. And of course, insects, spiders have eye shine. You can go out and find spiders. Uh, through eye shine, and of course you can turn them into stories as well. Marine life projects, marine invertebrates, that's me underwater photographing whales, marine fishes, schooling fishes. So this is a great adventure and it's never ending, never ending. So these are the sorts of things that you'll find now that people that are going through and doing science they learn how to use their cameras, they use those photographs to help tell their story. Of course, photography is very powerful. Whatever career that you're going into, it's a very useful thing to be able to deal with. Storytelling, you can see here the, the kelp, giant macrocystis kelp that you find around the shores. You'll find it right along the southern coast here in Western Australia. And in amongst that kelp, you'll find all sorts of animals that have adapted to live in amongst that. Bird projects, you know, the budgerigars. Uh, you can do bird projects by locality, like the, the Daintree region in the tropical north of Australia. You can focus just on one group of animals that live in amongst the, um, the rainforest or here, the wetlands or the woodlands. Uh, there's projects by behaviour, nesting behaviour. Uh, you can see out there with the, with the, the long lenses. So you, we use these very long zoom lenses when we're doing our bird photography. So a world of wonder, an absolute world of wonder and a great, a great, uh, um, great adventure. And of course, urban wildlife, this is um, Adelaide. Of course, you've got the, the black swan as your, um, for what's called the faunal icon for Western Australia. So you can do things uh, local, tell stories. You don't necessarily have to go to Kakadu to get involved in this sort of activity. So that's just a little, a little window, if you will, uh, into what has been my life adventure. Any questions?